Thank you, Sarah. Good morning. Good morning. I think you already know you're in for a treat today because Cheryl comes from her heart and she's speaking on the shining luster of small kind acts and that those come from her heart and that's who she is. I remember when I met her and we first started to spend time with each other that um, we were both working at the Heritage but we never met each other, oddly enough. And um, one of the people I knew quite well was Carol Danheiser, who was manager of the whole front of the store there. And Carol, when she referred to Cheryl, said she's an earth angel. And I've come to know what that means because I've come to know Cheryl. When she was preparing to have her son Joshua, she set an intention, and that intention was that Joshua would be gentle and kind. And I'll tell you, Joshua is gentle and kind, just like Cheryl is gentle and kind. And today she's going to share with us a song on kindness, that's one of her original creations, as well as the shining luster a small kind of acts. So let's give our total attention and appreciation to Cheryl Ann Bear Bernath. So thank you, honey, for that lovely introduction. This is the fellowship, right? So why am I talking about, you know, the luster, the shining luster of simple, kind acts? And I always ask before I speak, what is it that people most need to hear? Okay, and I had a, another idea in my mind, <laughs> but, and so I, I kind of worked on it a little bit and I set it aside. And then I woke up out of a sound sleep one morning with this line, the shining luster of small kind acts. And I was, okay, that's apparently what I'm going to speak on. And it was so complete. Um, but I questioned it a little bit because to me it sounded redundant. And goes, so I was questioning spirit a little bit. Like, shining and luster really are the same thing, right? It's all about light. And so why, you know, I was trying to change the title. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. So I realized that it really was that way for a very specific purpose and it had a specific message. And that luster and shining, yes, they mean the same thing, they're all about light. The sun shines. The stars shine. Luster is like a pearl, right? It's more precious because you have to look more closely at it to see the luster, kind of like labradorite, you know, and it has this mysterious kind of sheen to it. And some people are like stars. You know those people that their aura comes in the room about, you know, 30 seconds before they get there? Those people that are kind of shining. And then we have people that have this luster that you appreciate when you get to know them because it's, it's a different kind of light. And then um, I saw a recent article right after I got this, this um, inspiration for the talk, and I love this, because do you know, um, and it was a confirmation that this was timely, um, in December of 2019, Virginia Beach was voted the most caring city in America. Wow. And you live here, right? Okay, I love this, because this reflects the Virginia Beach that I know and it reflects the, the fellowship that I know. It all depends on where you look, right? So look at the fellowship. This church, you know, the little church with a big heart, I love that because we're very inclusive and we're very welcoming and we help local causes and people in need, right? It takes a village, we're a village here at the fellowship. So how did they decide that we were the kindest city in America. Um, they compared 100 of the largest cities in America and they had 39 indicators of a compassionate spirit. And I thought this was really lovely. Um, that ranged from share of sheltered 
uh, homeless people, okay, and um, the number of people that were volunteering their hours and also the share of income that people had donated to, um, to worthy, needy causes in Virginia Beach. But what they didn't rate is the little, small acts of kindness. And they kind of build up, right? They're like when you throw a pebble in a pond and that little ripple starts out really small, but if you watch it, it grows and grows. And when you commit a small, kind act, you never know how it will touch someone farther down the line, or we rarely know. You know, and each one just builds upon the other and makes a bigger wave. And I've always been really fascinated. I don't know if you've ever looked at a pond when it's raining, but if you look when the drops of water hit the pond and they make those circles, when they hit next to one another, you would think, in my intellectual mind, that when the waves hit, they'd cancel each other out and it would create a mess. It doesn't. They go through each other. They're still perfect circles, and they, they just go through one another, and they keep going out. And in some cases, if they're dropped at the same time, they actually kind of harmonize, and they make a really big wave. But I was always really fascinated by that. So that, that line that we've heard you know, all the time in the bumper stickers, practice random acts of kindness, and senseless beauty that was actually written on a napkin in 1983 in Sausalito, California, by a writer, and her name was Ann Herbert, and it just kind of caught on. Someone, you know, found the napkin and they thought it was really cool, and she ran with it. And um, another lovely synchronicity, since I had no idea why I was going to be speaking on this particularly, is I just found out that Monday this next week starts the Random Acts of Kindness Week. And I didn't even know there was such a thing, actually, but this is it, guys, so remember that and take that out there. So those small kind acts can sometimes be doing something. Um, sometimes not doing something is a small kind act. The very first story that I thought of that always touched me and I think illustrates this so perfectly um, was a story I had a really long time ago and it made a, an impression on me. And that talked about uh, two boys who were middle school and this boy named Mark is walking home from school one day and he's following another boy that he he's doesn't know and he sees that that other boy is struggling. He's carrying a tremendous amount of books and he's carrying some clothes and he's carrying baseball equipment and he's carrying a tape recorder, he's carrying all this stuff and he sees him stumble and he drops everything. And I think for a moment he saw that look, you know, of despair that he was going to have to pick all this stuff up. And so kind of impulsively he just, he, he ran over and he helped him pick things up and he helped carry that burden. So. On the walk home, he finds out that this other Bill, you know, they have things in common. You know, he loves history and he loves baseball. And he finds out that Bill has been having some trouble with his classes, although he's very, very smart and he's taking advanced classes. And he finds out he just also broke up with his girlfriend. So when they get to Bill's house, Bill invites Mark in and they have a Coke and they watch a little TV and, and they chat and they have some some laughter and then Bill uh, and Mark goes his separate way and eventually this was a middle school they end up in high school together and occasionally they run into one another and um, they have lunch together you know but um, they know one another and at graduation their their senior year Bill pulls Mark aside and says I really want to talk to you I want to tell you something and um, he says, do you ever wonder why I was carrying so much stuff that day that you helped me when we were walking home from school? And he confides that he cleaned his locker out so that nobody would have to deal with the mess because he had saved up a lot of his uh, mother's sleeping pills and he was actually headed home to commit suicide. 
And he said that day, that little small kind thing you did that day, he said, and that afternoon that we spent together, he said, I realized that I had a really good time and if I had done that, I would have missed out on other times like that that were going to be in the future. So he said, that day when you picked up my books, you did a lot more. You saved my life. So, you know, I looked the story up on the Internet. Now, that story actually came from Chicken Soup for the Soul by Jack Canfield. And, um, which was full of true inspirational tales. And it was written by John Slatter. When I looked it up, just to be curious, you know, where it came from, I found a different story that was much expanded and it was much exaggerated. And this was the one that people were mainly repeating. And I looked to see what the difference was in the stories. And the story that, that got expanded out there was um, that Mark found Bill was being bullied, you know, when all his books fell, and he ran in and he rescued him, and then they became best friends, and, and spent, you know, all of high school together, and went places together, and then at the valedictorian speech, Bill gives this speech and thanks Mark for saving his life. Well, that's not the actual real story, but what I noticed the most was the intention of the story because he impulsively did a small kind act because he felt the urge to help somebody. And the other story, he got back a lot of acclaim, right? And it, it became much bigger, but in a way it became much less important in that way. So I really like the original story better. It's smaller, and he wasn't rescuing him from bullies, and they didn't become best friends. And there wasn't a valedictorian speech, but it was a lustrous act. Not obviously shining. You had to look closely to see the beauty of it, and it didn't seem like a big deal at the time, but it was a pebble in the pond. So you never know, as you go about your day, you know, if that stranger that you meet is hanging by their last thread. You just, you really don't know. And one unkind word of judgment could just push them a little over the edge. So I say give people the benefit of the doubt there, okay, when you're interacting with people. Um, I had a really funny, she's not here today, rats, but I had a really funny thing happen. I had um, come to church one Sunday and I was wearing these really wild pants. They're like big paisley and they're purple and blue and and they're kind of crazy wild and I love them because they make them really happy and one of the ladies who goes here came up to me she said Cheryl she said those pants she said I have a pair of pants like that and I'm afraid to wear them you know and I knew because I know her that she wasn't being insulting she was just telling me that it was giving her the courage to wear that but I thought if a perfect stranger came up and said that to me I'm not sure if I would have taken it in the same way, and, but I know her, and I knew her intention. So giving people the benefit of the doubt, I could have responded in an insulted way if it had been, in a, been a stranger. But I tend to give people the benefit of the doubt because I think for the most part, people are kind. And I've said a lot of stupid things, and I'm sure most of you had, and after you said them, thought, what did I just say? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, you know, wouldn't you hope that in a situation like that, someone else gave you the benefit of the doubt, right? <clears throat> so, my next story comes from a story that was told by Judith Orloff at, at one of the ARE conferences. And a client of hers, she's a psychotherapist, told her, she's also a, a psychic, um, told her this story, and we'll call this lady Sue. And Sue is, told Judith she had a very, very bad automobile accident um, on her way home one day, and um, she the the three the freeway was blocked for miles because of this accident that was such a mess, and she actually was thrown out of the car, and she has a near death experience. 
okay? And she sees herself, she feels herself rise out of her body, and she's looking down at her broken body on the road, and the EMTs are working on her. And she sees this really bright beam of light that's coming down from the sky and is focused on her body. And so she said, I just had the urge to follow it because it was coming down, but then it, it went off in the direction of the, the line of cars. And she said, as she floated above this line of cars, she could hear and she could feel people's anger and frustration because they were late and they were stuck in traffic and they couldn't actually see the accident up ahead. They, you know, didn't really know what had happened, uh, but she could feel it. But she said she followed that beam of light and she said the beam of light came down to this one car. And so she in her spirit body is floating above and she sees a woman and she can hear her in her head and she can feel her praying for whoever was in that accident up ahead. So she felt that prayer. And so eventually she pulled, she feels a real pull to go back to her body and they're working on her, they're reviving her. So she's pulled back into her body and they take her off in an ambulance to the hospital. And when she regains consciousness, and this is what makes it so interesting, she remembers the license plate of the car with the woman inside who was praying for her. And she actually has a friend who tracks down the license plate and she finds the lady's name and address and she writes her a letter and she sends her flowers. And she says, thank you for what might have seemed like a small random act at the time. She didn't rush out of her car and run down there and try and revive anyone with CPR, but she just sent a prayer. And she wanted her to know what a big thing that was and how that helped her. So it might have felt like a small thing at the time. And sometimes when we decide not to react, you know, or do the same, have the same thing over and over, we respond which is more a conscious choice to act in a certain way. So sometimes not doing something can be a small act of kindness as well. And I call this mom and the apples. My mom, and she was probably in her 70s at the time, came home from Walmart one day and she's, I helped her with her groceries and we brought the groceries in the house and she sets the groceries down on the table and she has a really odd look on her face and I'm wondering what happened at Walmart. And she explains to me that as she takes her apples out of the bag that they're very bruised. <laughs> and the reason is she got a very surly cashier. And she said when she was putting my apples in the bag, she threw them <laughs> into the bag. And I think that my mom's face must have been so startled when she did it that the woman, as she was actually paying, finally confessed to her that she was getting married that day and they had called her into work. And she said, I should be at my wedding. I should be getting ready for my wedding. She was hanging out by a thread of nerves and a web of anxiety at that time. And my mom's small kind act was not to berate her, not to call the manager, which she could have, because she had bruised apples now, but she just let it go. And of course, she understood after the woman explained what was going on, but how many times during the day do we do something and people don't explain, and we have no idea what might be going on with them. So imagine you're walking in the woods and you see a small dog sitting by a tree and it looks pretty harmless and so you approach it and suddenly it lunges at you with its teeth bared and you're frightened and angry right because that self-defense kicks in but you notice that one of its legs is caught in a trap so immediately your mood shifts okay from anger to concern you see the dog's aggression is coming from a place of vulnerability and pain. And 
and this applies to all of us, when we behave in hurtful ways, it's because we're caught in some kind of a trap. The more we look through the eyes of wisdom at ourselves and one another, the more we cultivate a compassionate heart. And that mean little dog story is by Tara Brock. So myself, what I do is I play this little game as I go about my day, and I call it the what if game, right? So what if the person that just has been tailgating you for three miles has a young child that just got off the school bus and nobody is home to meet them because the babysitter got the flu and canceled at the last minute? What if that person who was so impatient with you at the bank has a mother who's just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and they're struggling with caring for them or putting them in a nursing facility? What if that person who just criticized you has only ever heard criticisms in their whole life and they're growing up? They don't know how to give a compliment. What if that was never modeled to them? You know, I worked with very little kids and very often I would discover on meeting their parents or whoever was bringing them up why they acted the way they did <laughs> when I met their parents. So my go-to phrase for such situations is, Father, Mother, God, forgive them for they know not what they do. And because I realized recently that if we've had a similar experience, it's much easier to give someone the benefit of the doubt and to um, sympathize with them and empathize rather than actually criticizing them or judging them. But we've not all had the same experiences. And uh, how many of you, as you get older, realize some of the things about your parents as they got older that used to be really irritating? Now you totally understand. It happens to me daily. And I think, oh, mom, I'm sorry. Now I understand some of what she was going through. So what can we do purposefully to build that muscle of compassion? So some suggestions that you can do for this week um, as we move into our random acts of kindness week. Thanking people and just a little thing, a little thank you. David is the absolute best at thanking people. And he makes a point of thanking everybody throughout the day. You know, sometimes I think randomly, but no. He will thank everybody, and it's very conscious with him. And it's a great example. Tell people when they're doing a good job, not just when they aren't doing a good job. You know, you can talk to their manager if they've just been giving you really good service and say, wow, you did a great job when you hired that person because I just really had a good experience. Complimenting a stranger. You know, I do this all the time and I, I love it, um, especially if it's the elderly or a child. Um, now, my mom when she got a certain age, finally stopped dyeing her hair. <laughs> and she was really self-conscious about it. And we were eating in IHOP one day, and uh, this lady, as she went out the door, took the time to stop and tap my mom on the shoulder and said, you have the most beautiful hair. Now mom, you know, she had wavy hair, and it was silver and white now. But my mom glowed when she said that because she didn't believe her hair was beautiful anymore. And a perfect stranger thought her hair was beautiful, and she said something to her. She glowed. Um, you know, with children, you're giving them an example, too. And I often hear people talk to their children in the stores and things in ways that, that make me a little sad, you know. And we can kind of interject a little compliment as we pass them to model something a little different. You can just let somebody get ahead of you in line. You know, sometimes when you have a couple items and, and you know, you get in line and there's somebody with three carts of items in front of you, it feels really good to be kind and let that person go ahead. 
mm, it's going to be a few more minutes. So what? Um, I have a friend who, I'm from Buffalo, and between Buffalo and Niagara Falls, there are two bridges, and you have to pay a toll. And my friend Nikki would pay the toll for the person behind her, um, who she never saw. She just liked to imagine the person pulling up to the toll booth and saying, the, the person saying, well, your toll's paid for already. It's on them, who just disappeared into the distance. She loved to imagine that kind of just little spark of someone doing something kind for them. Leaving little notes for people, encouraging messages for strangers. You know, David leaves me a note every single morning when he goes to work. And it's a long one, like eight and a half by 11 <laughs> every morning, but he prioritizes that. And I've, I've heard now of people leaving notes along sidewalks or hanging them on trees. Um, little painted stones with little lovely messages that people can pick up or children can pick up as they're walking. Sidewalk art, you know, with, with um, chalk. Little treasures that, you know, pick you up and may, then light people up inside. You can keep blessing bags in your car for the homeless. So the people that are asking for, you know, we always think they're asking for money, and for the most part, I'm sure they would, you know, maybe prefer to have money. But if you don't feel comfortable giving them money because you don't know if they have an addiction problem or whatever, you know, we keep blessing bags in the cars that have some little things, you know, little snacks, maybe a comb, uh, the toothbrush, mouthwash, those little things that people that are not having a home need, but you don't think about it. And, you know, when I give it to them, I just say, if this is not what you need, just pass it on because they will probably cross paths with somebody who needs it. But I have never once had someone refuse it or get angry because it wasn't money. They've been just really sweet and said, bless you, you know, for seeing them, for one thing. Um, you don't know with people that are asking for money. You never know. Are they conning you or is it the real thing? But I think sometimes we need to give them the benefit of the doubt because we don't know, even if someone does have an addiction, what they've gone through to get to that space that they cannot keep a home. And sometimes it's just through great tragedy. But we don't know. My best friend in Buffalo um, lives in a neighborhood that's, um, that has a lot of African Americans have moved into her Polish neighborhood. And a lot of her old time Polish neighbors were very resentful and she said she was home one day and um, the kids across the street were break dancing in the street. And she said they had the music on really loud. The it was out in the street. And she said, I started to watch them. And she said, I knew my neighbors were getting really irritated. But she said, they were having so much fun. And she said, they were good dancers. And she said, I sat at the window and watched them for a while. And then she said, she decided to call up and she ordered a couple pizzas and had them sent to the break dancers in the street and said, thank you for the entertainment because I really enjoyed watching you dance. So she created a different kind of bridge in her neighborhood um, in a positive way. Sometimes just picking up a nail in the street as you're walking or a screw so somebody else doesn't drive over it. You know, on the Casey readings, one of the things that said Jesus did an affirmation all the time that was others, Lord, others. So not just looking at what might affect us, but what might affect someone, make someone else's day a little bit easier. And sometimes just smiling, just smiling at a stranger. When your first impulse, when you pass somebody who you don't know, is to smile at them. You're on the path to enlightenment because you're seeing through the eyes of God. You're seeing how God sees them. So I had, when I was facilitating at ARA, um, we had some big conferences and I was in charge of making everyone feel comfortable and introducing the speakers. And one day we had a very difficult lady who was just giving everyone a hard time and she just had, you know, the expression on her face made you not want to approach her. She, was, she had been complaining a lot, and she was there with her elderly mother who looked like she was in her 90s. And um, 
they were sitting by a door where I needed to actually open the door because it got so hot in the auditorium. And they didn't want the door open because of her mother and being right by the door, even though it wasn't really cold out. And I felt the resistance when I, and I asked her, could, could we move you over a little bit so that we can open the door? Because people and everyone was doing this and <laughs> they were really warm. And she really gave me a lot of resistance, but she finally, very grudgingly, moved towards the door into the auditorium. And when I sat her down, I thanked her and I made her a volunteer. I said, I'm gonna make you a volunteer because the people that sit at the doors, they're our greeters. And her face started to change. And I said, so when people come in the door, you just smile at them and, and welcome them to ARE. And she looked a little baffled at first, you know, but I noticed later on that she was sitting at the door and she had a big smile on her face. She had completely turned that around. Now I know that that was spirit tapping me on the shoulder because it really didn't make a whole lot of common sense to make somebody who was giving everyone a hard time a greeter, but it worked. And that's when I know spirit is actually, is actually working. Everyone can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve, grammar police out there. You only need a heart full of grace a soul generated by love. And that was Martin Luther King Jr. And finally, be a model for the children because they're watching you. Your children, your grandchildren, strangers' children on the street. And kindness is contagious. And I love this last story because it shows how contagious kindness is. And I found this lady, I call her the Wawa lady. I found her on, the, um, on Facebook and I watched her video. And she told this story that she was in Wawa one day and she was getting gas and she left her car at the, um, at the pumps and she went inside and when she was going to pay uh, for her gas, she noticed somebody behind her who had a cup of coffee and she said it looked like she didn't have a lot else but um, she said I just felt this I wanted to do a random acts of kindness thing and you know and I thought mm, I went down to buy this lady her coffee you know and maybe that would really make her day and make her happy and so first of all she said she asked the lady is that all you have <laughs> just in case you know she hadn't you know, had a lot of stuff where she couldn't see it and she said she looked a little confused that she was being asked by the person in line in front of her if that was all she had. She said, yes. And she said, I'm gonna buy you your cup of coffee because you know it's, it's just a random act of kindness and I hope you have a blessed day. And so she bought the lady her cup of coffee and she said she left and she was feeling really good and she felt really good from doing that little small kind thing. And when she got outside, she noticed that there was a guy cleaning her windshield. And she said, I just you know, couldn't believe that that quickly, what I had done had rippled out in an act of kindness to someone else. And she said, so I ran up to him, and she said, I'm a little over the top, <laughs> but she said, I really felt it. And she said, I ran up and I hugged this perfect stranger you know, and said, thank you, thank you so much. And she said, I went on and on about the kindness of humanity and, you know, and how good it was that, that people help one another. And she said, as I stepped back from hugging him, I realized that my car was over there. <laughs> and she said, so I did what anyone else would do. I said, bye, have a nice day. And I went to my car and I drove off. <laughs> and she pulled over in the parking lot nearby. And the whole, no lie, the whole first two, three minutes of this video, she was just laughing hysterically. And it really took a lot to watch the video because I'm thinking, well, you know, what is going on here? But she told the story and she said, by now, he 
probably realizes I got in the same kind of car <laughs> and drove off and realizes what happened. But she chose, her small act of kindness was not to be embarrassed, but to reward herself for having done something and for thanking somebody. Even though he wasn't, at, he was actually just washing his own car window, he got a hug, right, that day. So it rippled out in a different way because once she put that video on the internet, I cried watching that video. I laughed till I cried and it made me really happy because of the way she responded to what she did. It was really lovely. So she was kind to herself and she chose to see the humor and we don't always do that when we do something like that. And I had to laugh because I thought, oh my God, that could be me. That could be like anybody at the fellowship doing that. That could be you, Jonal. Oh yeah. <laughs> she chose to still believe in the goodness of humanity. You know, the Casey readings, Edgar's one of my, one of my spiritual teachers, his, his source and his reading said that we're all in earth school and we have tests all the time, and we think that we may pass or fail, right, in our school. And sometimes we think we have to study harder, and we're not focusing enough. And what if we find out, when we get to the other side, that it wasn't really that we're being judged by the classes that we think we're taking at all. What if we find out we're being judged by our behavior in the hallway for how we treat our fellow travelers in the school when we think the teacher's not watching, right? Are we pushing and shoving? Or will we stop to pick up another student's dropped books 